if you are here to listen to an exciting conversation about how ed tech is transforming education in Latin America, you're in the right place. <laughs> if you're not here for that, you're also in the right place. If you're a tennis fan and you couldn't get in another room, we most welcome you. Uh, <laughs> thanks a lot for taking time out of your day. Uh, I'm here with three other people. The fourth person, Esteban Torres, uh, Senator for Arge Argentina. He is dealing with senatorial business and he couldn't make it. He sent his apologies. I'd like to introduce you quickly to our panelists, Emiliano Vegas, who uh, leads education at the Inter-American Development Bank. If you don't know what that is, she will tell you shortly. Uh, Guillermo Elush, who uh, is the CEO of Nova Escola in Brazil, and then Viviana Zocco from uh, VidaTech in Argentina. If you want more biographical information about any of those folks, go to Google, Wikipedia, talk to a friend, and get it there. That's all the bio stuff will do. My name is Mike Tercano. I work on EdTech stuff at the World Bank. With that said, less than one minute intro, over to you, uh, Emiliana. So what excites you about uh, what you're seeing and the opportunities for ed tech across Latin America? Thank you, Mike. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, well, there's a lot going on in Latin America. Um, I think uh, a lot of the exciting things are happening at small scale, and the, one of the challenges we have is how to bring them to scale so that all students have the opportunity to really get access to excellent education. Um, one of the things that I've seen most recently is a program in Chile that we have been evaluating closely called, called Conecta Ideas, which is uh, leveraging technology to teach math uh, to kids, it, and it is very scalable. So now, for example, the Peruvian government um, is interested in adopting it and adapting it and scaling it up in their uh, system. Uh, another program Rebecca mentioned yesterday is the in the Amazon in Brazil, where uh, TV, kind of direct TV type of uh, technology with Skype cameras are being used to provide um, quality secondary education to students who live in very small and isolated villages across the Amazon forest. Um, that's, uh, I think, very promising. It's also being expanded um, at the neighboring state of Pará. And then I'd like to mention one project that I think is quite uh, impressive. I had the opportunity to visit it last year, and it's in Nicaragua. And it's basically the, kind of the version of 2018-19 of the One Laptop Per Child that was started many years ago at um, MIT. And what the Fundación Zamora Terán in Nicaragua has done is really um, use uh, the devices in a way that they have lots of content that they really train teachers to be facilitators for the most underserved communities in rural Nicaragua. And they uh, work with a volunteer group to um, basically every school break, take the devices back, take them all apart, um, you know, basically test every component, uh, replace what's not working. And that has extended the life of the devices tremendously and made it very cost effective. And so that's another promising intervention that I wanted to mention because I think um, as technology keeps dropping in price still, it's a, it's a challenge for our countries, and particularly in rural areas, to have devices at work that have content in them and that don't necessarily need to be connected to the grid, you know, 24-7. Great, I think that not necessarily need to be connected to the grid 24-7 is a theme we'll refer to and return to a couple times here. And uh, just point of reference, uh, you said we a couple times, and you talked about Chile and Brazil and Nicaragua. What, where do you work? Oh, I work at the Inter-American Development Bank. And, and what it, is that? It is a development bank, and we are owned by uh, 26 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, and also by donor governments across Europe, the United States, Canada, and China, and Korea, and Japan. And basically, our mission is to uh, support countries in the region, in Latin America and the Caribbean, to develop, to reduce poverty, and we do that by working uh, through government, but also through the private sector. Um, we have uh, the IDB is the kind of government side, and then we also have IDB Invest, which is the private sector side, and together we're the IDB group. Thanks, Miliana. And Guillermo, so what excites you about maybe what you're doing in Brazil and what you're seeing in Brazil with technology and education? Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Mike. Um, we are doing wonderful stuff in Brazil, and I, I think we are not in... We, we don't have technology spread out as we have here in America, but we are doing fantastic work there, um, mostly on private schools, and we have a very different system in Brazil than we have here. 
uh, because most of the wealthiest families put their kids in private schools and not public schools that, like we have here. Uh, on the other hand, what we are seeing now is most of those um, experiences are now um, starting to migrate to, to the public sector. So most of the players in Brazil are starting now to create solutions to help kids in, 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 the, in public schools. And we have like 80% of the kids in Brazil go to public schools. So what we are seeing now, we have a lot of um, apps for homework, uh, we have a lot of apps for teacher training, um, a lot of stuff to, to deal with bureaucracy um, that we are testing in, um, in the Brazilian um, districts, and, um, and a lot of uh, uh, assessment work. So this is, this is something that we are still on, on the early days, I would say, comparing to the US. Um, we are a little bit laggers, but things are moving very, very fastly now. And I project that in ten, two years, three years from now, uh, there, we should see a major outbreak of technology uh, in, into the public system in Brazil. And so being here and, and reading and listening to all those great stories that we are seeing and, and hearing here in the, in the US, it's great for us to, 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 to inspire the work we are doing there. Excellent, and you said we, so who are we? Are you talking about Brazilians in general, or your? I was talking about Brazilian in general, but um, I work at Nova Escola. Uh, Nova Escola is, is a platform to help teachers. Uh, we are the go-to place for teachers who are seeking development, uh, professional development and, and information, and we are now growing to become the, the number one platform for teachers in terms of helping them also to make some more money and also to save some time. And, and this is something that we are, you know, working on right now. Um, uh, we started as a platform for information, news and hard news, and we are now migrating to pedagogical services and then to other uh, services to teachers to help with their lives. So very excited to be in that place right now in Brazil. Awesome. And in Private schools, public schools? We are mainly focused on public schools. Okay, That's so you're, you're part of that transition from where there's a lot of ed tech in private schools and it's, it's both slowly and quickly moving out. This is what's moving us. Yeah, excellent. Viviana, so uh, what excites you about uh, what you're seeing uh, in Argentina and what you're doing? Uh, uh, hi. Yeah. Um, I'm Viviana Soco. I'm the founder and CEO of Viratech. Viratech had been uh, in the last years promoted, promoting digital reading and given high quality content in Spanish for addressing all the station of our country, which is very uh, large. Uh, we have different roles for digital reading and so we have digital libraries. So to address uh, universities, uh, schools, publics and um, privates. But today, the digital library developed to what is an educational platform, which is to, uh, it's a platform with content, um, and high technology to address the, the learning path of students to help teachers uh, taking out their bureaucracy papers they have to done and so they can concentrate on what really is, is important for uh, teaching and um, also there have uh, we are working and uh, on the offline of technology because uh, in Latin America especially in our country there's no connectivity everywhere so given technology to those all the, these parts of uh, different towns that uh, have a lot of students but they do not have the the, uh, the ability to get that content, good content, and, and the teacher can, even when they are not at school, can uh, take the, 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 the tracking of what they are doing, the, where they have difficulties, where they can, uh, if they have uh, challenges they cannot do, if they have problems with any, any subject, the, the teacher can, can have it. So we are working on that, and uh, and what we have l here is a problem in uh, all Latin America. Really, uh, it's uh, the 
the, so, the society have changed, the needs have changed, millennials have other demands, but education poli poli politics haven't changed. So we are in, a, in my understanding, we are on a crisis of content. The content doesn't engage our students. Uh, we, are, uh, we are not investing enough in teachers. We are crucial for making the change, the transformation. And this is for all the, the reason, I think. Yeah, and so let me pick up this idea of teachers. And so Emiliana, both, both uh, Viviana and Pierre may have mentioned this issue of, of teachers. And I look across the region and see lots of ed tech project, uh, products and solutions aimed at teachers. Uh, why do you think this is the case? Is there a particular challenge for teachers in Latin America, Emiliana, you think isn't being met? And how do you see technology being relevant or not relevant? Well, I think um, not just in Latin America, but, also, but across the world, the way our education systems developed and evolved where um, under the theory that teachers contained the knowledge and they were there to teach students who would then learn that knowledge. And what we know today is that knowledge is ubiquitous and that um, the role of teachers need to change to someone who embraces learning with their students and becomes a sort of facilitator, uh, curious person who is not afraid of making mistakes. And, and that can be very threatening for the way that a lot of teachers have been trained. So I think the big challenge um, in what we're facing is, you know, how to you know, have teachers embrace technology, not feel threatened by it, and also embrace the fact that a lot of the students they're facing are, um, are digital natives. And so they kind of can learn quicker. They can help them along. Um, and I think that's a challenge overall. Um, another, I mean, I totally agree with what Viviana said, that we're facing a learning crisis in Latin America. We see it in the international assessments. Um, most of our countries have increased education investment significantly as a share of GDP. So there's been, a, a, I think, a political commitment and a social commitment to investing in education. But that hasn't gone hand in hand with transforming education to meet the needs of today and the future. Um, and so, you know, kids in, in Argentina and Uruguay and Brazil are dropping out of school between 14 and 17 at extremely high rates and, and alarmingly high rates for what they're gonna face because they're bored. I mean, it's not economic necessity in the majority of cases, it's they don't find school relevant to their needs. Um, and so I think for all of you who work in ed tech, it's how to, you know, I think the challenge is uh, we do have to work with teachers. They're very strong in our region. They're unionized, they're organized. And also a lot of research shows that students um, really appreciate and there's a lot of benefits to them of that in-person interaction um, with an adult who cares about them and their you know, well-being and their uh, development. And so how to help teachers uh, you know, kind of change from being a teacher to being a facilitator of learning and someone who embraces technology, I think is the biggest challenge for our region. Thanks, Emiliana. And so Guillermo, how, how are you doing that in Brazil? How are you working with teachers? And you mentioned particularly across the region where teacher unions are very strong. Yeah. Is, is, what, what does that mean in the context, for example, of Brazil? And how are you working with them and not against them? Um, yeah, they, they are very unionized. And the, pro, the, the issue with the unions is that they, they, they really want to protect the teachers. And that's their, 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 their role. Um, and some of them see technology as a threat. As a threat. But what we are seeing right now is that uh, working together with them is that we still don't have the technology available in Brazil to help the teachers with the real needs that they have. So what we have been doing so far, we have fo focusing most of the use of technology to students and, uh, and not to teachers. And those available to teachers are still not is good enough to, to engage them and, and to unload them of stuff they, that the technology should be unloading. So um, I think it's like when we say that teachers are somehow afraid or against technology, I don't think that's correct. Um, they all use Facebook and Instagram and, and they research on Google and, and they do all the stuff. They all, mo most of them or, or almost all of them have smartphones and stuff and computers at home. 
so they're not, it's not that they don't know how to use. Of course, kids know much better than they do as the kids are mostly native. Um, but they use technology on the day-to-day -day businesses and, and jobs. So what I think they are missing is the right technology to the right needs. And we have very specific needs in Brazil. So literacy, for, in, for instance, is a, is a very important problem that we have in Brazil. Uh, there are a lot of kids uh, into ninth grade that cannot read and write. Um, and I'm not saying that they cannot read and write well. It, I'm saying that they cannot read and write. So a ninth uh, grade teacher does not know how to, to, you know, to, to teach kids to write and, and read because they are not prepared for that. So how can technology help on this specific issue that is very relevant in Brazil? And that's what we are focusing now, to, to understand what kind of technology that really meets the, the real needs of Brazilian teachers and how we can help them um, to engage in the technology and how we can help them, help them to develop in their careers uh, to be more, well, more health, healthy and, and happier. Great, and so that challenges, I think, an opportunity and maybe an opportunity for some of you in the room who are either already in the Brazilian market or considering how what you provide can be relevant to this situation. Uh, Viviana, can you talk a little bit more about um, the situation of teachers in Argentina and maybe what was done wrong in the past and what you're, how, what you're trying to correct and how you're trying to support them now with technology? Uh, different issues. First, you talk about unions. Uh, or, uh, yes, you say yeah. sindicatos, unions. Unions and in our country, they are interested in salaries and politicians. So once they have sold teacher salaries and the politics with the administration, in a way, they don't have any problem consider something with technology. So that's not the case of have a problem with uh, the unions. Uh, in the past, there were a lot of uh, computers, one, one computer per child and all that kind of things. But the problem, they were not content. And the second problem is that the teachers were not trained to manage differently the classroom within the technology. As Emiliana says, the role of the teacher change. It's not the one who is in front of the classroom. It's the one that facilitates the, the, the learning uh, to the students. So uh, they are not afraid of technology. They are not, af they, in the research we have done, there was something, well, you are changing my role and nobody tell me how to do it now. Mm -hmm. And uh, now with this uh, new approach, um, teachers change the control of the, of the classroom. So there are friends, yesterday I control, uh, years ago, I, I controlled the classroom. Now what do I do? So that's why they sh should be trained, not only in technology, but also in uh, psychological things, emotional, in, in coaching, in other tools to, to integrate technology within the, with the classroom. Uh, if we invest on that, that's a, uh, we are good part of the, of the way uh, is, is being done. Yeah, that's, I know, a challenge everywhere. And, and having been in uh, lots of schools and lots of places, and as technology comes in, typically it makes just everything more complicated, more tools, new ways. And being in, in, in Uruguay, when they first rolled out the laptops there, and it was, there was a sort of a, a loosely organized chaos in classrooms. And teachers had to figure out how to organize or direct this chaos in new ways. Because when everyone had something that was much more interesting than the teacher in front of them, trying to figure out how to do this. And it's been, I, I think it's a struggle everywhere around the world, including um, in Latin America. Um, and Viviana, you mentioned uh, that you have a, you're focused on sort of off-grid or low connectivity or no connectivity environments or where there's connectivity sometimes. Could you tell us a little bit more about how you're approaching this connectivity challenge? When, uh, when uh, we decided to, to go to an education platform, we say, okay, we'll make a lot of research and, and how, uh, how to work within uh, schools with have connectivity, and the problem we have in some towns where there's no connectivity. And what happened in those rural areas? In these rural areas, the, the students go once or twice 
a month to school. They get the content and they get back where they, where they do not have connectivity. So what, uh, what we do is that they get the content for these two weeks that uh, on, a, on a device and then they do the, the, the read, uh, see a video or whatever the content is, make the activities and uh, all this is tracking. So when they come back and the, the teacher can, can uh, see what happened with that content and what were the difficulties uh, if, they, if the, the student had done the exercise several times, if he was stuck in what point, so they have, uh, the, the teacher has that information. And so she, and at that moment can work with, uh, with he or her, uh, with he or she uh, on that. And that's uh, what we call working offline, but even one, uh, once a month, two, man, two, uh, two, two times a month, have to have connectivity. Yeah, and that's a solution that is um, very relevant uh, for many communities in Argentina and across uh, the region um, as well. And it's something that you devise specific to the opportunities and, and the challenges. It, it's impossible to close the gap uh, if you don't see these kind of things because there are a lot of students that have the problem of understanding, uh, not only solving math problems. It's understanding and writing or for every day. And, and let's, uh, Guillermo, let's talk about this, the gap and the gap in Brazil, especially in the role of technology in either, uh, well, hopefully decreasing this gap or providing greater opportunity and not increasing it. We see around the world this, you know, they talk about the Matthew effect of educational technology from the book of Matthew and the Bible, sort of the rich get richer. Oftentimes, the groups that make best use of technology are those already advantaged and privileged in all sorts of ways. And where we introduce technology to narrow divides, in fact, we widen them. So uh, what is the thinking and what are the approaches you're taking in Brazil uh, not to create even further divides in a region and in a country that's known for them? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, I really don't know the answer to that. And, uh, and I think that's a debate. Um, I'm, and I'm not sure if, if that's totally correct or if we were just in time, because once we spread out technology to, to everyone, um, my, my guess or my hope is that we would see um, things kind of smoothing out, uh, because we would, um, of course, when, when we are implementing technology, there are, there are advantages that go to the, to the ones who implement them first, and those are the wealthiest ones. So I agree with you. But when we look in, into 10, 20, 50 years down the road, um, I hope that, that we would you know, eliminate those, those, those inequalities by, by advancing technology to everyone. And, um, and I think that we are, connectivity is also a huge problem in Brazil. Um, we are a, a continental country. We, we have uh, almost 50 million students in schools. Um, more than two, two million teachers in Brazil, and uh, we are a very large country, a, a lot of rural areas, a lot of jungle areas and stuff. Um, but I, I'm, I'm very, I think, optimistic about uh, the way that technology will come, connectivity will come to the classroom. Um, I, I think in a matter of two, three years, we would have most of Brazil covered with the, by, by connectivity. There are a lot of projects going on in Brazil, especially sponsored by the federal government to, to do so. Um, and I think our job is to, to, to deliver uh, the, the right technology. I, I, have, I understand that we have an issue about training teachers on, on specific stuff of technology like coding. We, if we want teachers to, to teach our students how to code, of course we'll have to train them on, on coding. Um, otherwise, I don't think we should train teachers to use technology. I think if, if we have to train them to use the technology, it's probably because the technology is not still, it's not right yet. Yeah, poorly designed for poorly them. Poorly designed, of course. So we, we, I think we are not doing enough. We need to, to have better technologies and deliver better technologies to them that, it, that we don't have to train them how to use those technologies. And so I'm very optimistic. I think um, we are 
Uh, there are a lot of engagement in education in Brazil. We are growing. Um, the country, for the first time, knows uh, the name of the, m the Minister of Education in Brazil, not for the right reasons, but... <laughs> <laughs> but which but one? <laughs> <laughs> which one? We have one for you. Uh, not for the right reasons, <laughs> but they know. So we have a debate on education going on in Brazil, so people are waking up. And, and a lot of efforts, a lot of uh, good people putting their hearts and minds into solving those, those issues. So I'm very optimistic. I think in, in a few years we'll have a very different environment uh, with regard to the use of technology. Great, thanks. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Brazil, or maybe for those of you who are and don't know about the, this resource, so CETIC, C-E-T-I-C in Brazil, publishes a great annual review of what's happening with uh, technology and education across the country. Brazil is the only country I know of in the world where uh, there's a small uh, tax, there's a fee associated with buying a domain name that then is used to support uh, public research and public activities related to the internet. And that is a very inventive way to be able to fund ongoing research. And they, they do a lot of it in Brazil, and that's a fantastic resource. Um, Guillermo mentioned this, uh, you know, if, if we really need to teach teachers how to use this stuff, maybe it's not well designed. Emiliano, what do you see? You know, people, I talked to people here yesterday, and they said, yeah, um, I might go to the session because we're interested in going into Latin America. Now, going into Latin America, it's like going into Europe. Going in, it's like going into the US with all the different education systems, uh, but um, uh, even more complicated in many ways. What, what advice would you have, or what's your perspective in someone who works across the whole region, a region that is incredibly diverse, uh, for thinking about opportunities to be active and, and to help make a difference? So one of the things that um, we are um, trying to kind of uh, crack a big problem is um, how to support the systems, the ministries, or whether it's federal or regional, to have, um, to use technology to have data at their fingertips for making better decisions. And that's a huge challenge. I was talking to someone yesterday and they were saying it's the same in the US, um, in some districts. But it, it is amazing, we've done a stock taking of what um, companies are out there that can provide services that um, have you know data systems for students <coughs> combined with teachers combined with financial resources going to schools so that you can know you know where is your money being spent I, I mentioned earlier that our countries are have, have really made large uh, commitments to invest more and more in education and it's becoming a public debate as to you know we care about education but if you guys can't deliver why should we continue to be pouring in more um, tax money into the system and part of the reason they can't deliver is things like you know, in one of our countries, we just found out that the person who uh, was supervising all the infrastructure investments nationwide died, and he, she or he was keeping everything by, by hand, and nobody knows, you know, the status of anything. Um, you know, that's just incredible in the 21st century. Um, but that goes on and on across our region. The same for, you know, if you want to link specific teachers to students or even to schools. You know, the system that assigns teachers to schools is completely divorced from, you know, the rest. Um, and so, you know, I've been in trips in some countries with the Minister of Education arrive at a school and she asks, where is the teacher that, you know, three weeks ago I appointed? And they're like, well, they haven't gotten the final signature from the president of the country because for every appointment it starts at the local level, but then the president has to and it's just so inefficient. So technology can really address so many of these problems that are keeping just basic things from happening. And, you know, we're talking about transforming teachers into facilitators and, you know, and learning, but a lot of our, our governments still have problems of knowing where they are, what schools they're teaching, you know, how to um, ensure that substitutes are there when teachers are absent. Abs absent. And so you know, I invite all of you who work in technology to help us with this huge, um, and to not think in your little space, you know, because a lot of you work in, you know, the great, you know, uh, technology app for students to access content or the technology app for, you know, human resource management or learning management system, but these things, if they don't talk to each other, they're, they're you know, uh, continuing this big challenge for us. Yeah, absolutely. And so, and the ch with uh, government funding, being so predominant across the region and big government contracts, that's sort of the holy grail. If you can get the government of Peru to buy your product, that is fantastic. 
uh, and they don't buy your competitor's product, and so that's maybe even better. Um, <laughs> but thinking about with the, the dominant role of the uh, public sector across the region, um, some companies I know say, we want to go outside that. We either want to go to private schools, or we want to go directly to families. Do you see, Viviana, is there a market for private uh, uh, going directly to families in Argentina? Do you think that's a, a useful approach, the right approach? Is, are there opportunities there? Do you think that is really diverting us from wh what's most important? Uh, I think that uh, going to families with a solution, that's not the main thing. They are not, uh, they don't know, they, 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 but going to, uh, working with families about that we have to transform education that's mandatory. If not, things would not happen uh, because public schools need, uh, and then the ministry and uh, needs to have the demand of the society to to change things. If not, mm, the minister of education can be known or not. But if the the, 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 the uh, legislation, the Congress do not find that there's a demand from family, things won't change. So I won't go, in my case, or with a pro to family. We can show the advantages, but finally they delegate on the school what is, which are the better uh, tools to use, and what kind of technology integration, and they delegate on teachers. But families should, um, be uh, in front of the demand for politicians to change things. Guillermo, does that uh, correspond to how you see things or the reality in Brazil, or is it a little different? Um, yeah, I think it's more or less the same. I wouldn't start by, by going to families directly. There is a market for that in Brazil, of course. Um, there are people doing that, uh, in fact. Uh, but I agree with Viviana that this is, this is probably not the, the, the place to start. Um, I think that there is a, a huge market for private for the, 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 the private sector of, of education in Brazil, and there's a lot of people, you know, already working on that, and 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 mostly with solutions to schools, the complete solutions to schools with content assessments, homeworks, and and stuff like that, all integrated. Um, that's what I have been seeing going on in Brazil, and, and mostly uh, backed up by technology, but but not directly to schools. But, but the thing is, it, when, when, when we start using more and more technology, and I agree that we should uh, start connecting those things, and that's very important, specific, sp especially for the, private, for the public sector. Once we start connecting those things, we will, we will, need, we will have much more information, much more data mm -hmm. on what's going on. And this is something that we suffer a lot in Brazil. We don't have any data, any reliable mm -hmm. data on what, I mean, I'm being a little bit uh, exaggerated here. Of course, we have some data, but well, we, we need to have much more data on what's the, wh what the teacher is doing in, in the classroom and, and who's performing well, who needs uh, more help, and we don't have this information. So the good thing about have not having almost nothing is that when we start doing the, you know, the, the, the increment will be amazing. So this is where we are right now, and, uh, and I mean, that's where I would start. By, by, by putting my money on. Great, and speak, so go, uh, uh, sort of riffing off the theme of money, we'll go to the lady who works for the bank. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and Emiliana, earlier you mentioned about education systems and challenges for education systems. And there's a great report that came out two weeks ago, maybe, from the Midyard Network that looked at, you know, thinking about the, a larger ecosystem and what needs to be in place in countries if they're able to take advantage of uh, investments in ed tech. And uh, from your perspective at the, at the IDB, the Inter-American Development Bank, what sort of conversations need to take place if the types of enabling investments are to be made uh, and, and how maybe can a, a private uh, investors, philanthropic investors be involved in those debates or even what are those debates? What, what, what should we be talking about? And are they um, the right investments to be making or should we just be focused on narrowly on, on improving literacy or are they, or are they the same? So I. I think um, one of the uh, more productive debates that I see happening is, is around um, kind of what r roughly people call 21st century skills, but it includes kind of coding, uh, computational thinking, socio-emotional skills, 
um, which are not your kind of traditional literacy and math and science. Um, and you know, for many years, the banks like ours were saying, well, we can't really go there because we haven't fixed you know, reading and writing and math. But yet, the more we don't go there, the more the gap grows between Latin America and the rest of the world. And we think, we see evidence that if we focus on these other skills, one, they tend to be, um, the governments in particular, tend to be more open to getting uh, private investments and, and, and companies to help because it's not something they have historically been doing. There's a little, you know, not a formal curriculum and stuff. And two, um, there's evidence that they, too, are tools for teaching or for, for students to acquire the basic skills. Um, so that's something we're very excited about. We're, we're at the IDB working with um, many partners um, from uh, you know coding type of companies to uh, companies that do sports and music, or uh, when I say companies, I really mean nonprofits for the most part, um, but uh, who are really uh, at small scale trying to work with a, you know a group of schools and and show that this can make a difference in kids' lives and. and what we're trying to do is kind of draw what are the common threads about these programs and then try to scale them up um, across different countries and in the region as a whole. Excellent, excellent. We're, all, we're almost out of time, and so I've asked a bunch of questions, and you've given a bunch of answers. I thought maybe it would end with uh, giving you an opportunity to ask a question as a way to perhaps uh, start a conversation with some of the people in the room, perhaps afterwards. We're all here in San Diego for these few days, hopefully learning with our eyes, and especially our ears open, meeting lots of new people, seeing lots of new things. Is there a question, Viviana, that you would have that you hope to have answered, or at least uh, that is really um, was one of the reasons why you came to San Diego for this event? What's a question that we could pose to the audience? Do you? Oh, to the audience, <laughs> that's a big. Um, I, I came here just to learn, to know a, a lot of people, and to realize that the problem is the same globally, because really, uh, what I heard in all these sessions is that. Sometimes here in Argentina, we find out, in, and also in some places in Latin America, that all these problems is, is, uh, exclu is there's, uh, our exclusivity. And no, the, the transformation in education is something that ha is happening all around the world. So, um, Excellent, thanks. Guillermo, do you have a question you'd like to pose to the? Yeah, my question would be, um, I think we, we, we need to, improve a lot at uh, the development of teachers in Brazil and, and how we prepare them and how we and how we support them and and we are in Brazil I think we are lagging uh, if, if if we compare ourselves to a lot of countries in the world and and also in Latin America if we compare ourselves to Chile we are like 20 30 years behind Chile and so we don't have that time so how can we do how can we cope to, to, to this um, to this difference uh, in much less than 20 years. How can we do that in five years? And that would be my question. If someone has the answer, please call me. <laughs> <laughs> and Emiliana, last question to you. So one thing that keeps me up at night because we work with governments across the region and, and many of them, um, many countries have suffered different crises and, and we get the opportunity to kind of think about how to rebuild the education system. and. You know, in particular, I'm a Venezuelan national and there's possibly a, an opportunity to rebuild that system. And I keep thinking, do we want to rebuild the system the way it's always been done? Um, how can we think differently? Do we want to group kids by age in classrooms with one teacher in groups of 30 to 40 like it's always been done? Or do we want to leverage technology to engage kids in a different way, to have them learn from each other from early stages, to have them, you know, bridge those gaps that some of them will have? And you know, I, I tend to think the answer is, you know, we don't want to do things the same way we've done it. But how hard is it to really, um, you know, even in moments where you have the opportunity, where basically a, a huge crisis is also a huge opportunity, um, how can you um, think differently and, and get others on board? If anybody has the answer for that, please come see me. <laughs> Indeed, and how can we do that, and how can we do that collectively? I'd like to thank all of you. We are uh, bang on time. Thank all of you for your attention this morning. Thank you for not seeing Mr. Agassi. Thanks to Viviana, to Guillermo, to Emiliana. Thank you to the folks at, uh, to Rebecca and the folks at uh, Brookings Q. Thanks to the organizers of ASU GSV, and we will see you out in the hallway. Have a great Thanks day. Cheers.